So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Raghu Pazopati, who is currently professor at the uh, University of Purdue. I will talk about uh, some confidence set for statistical functional of time series. And uh, Raghu uh, is, uh, is a well recognized researcher in the stochastic programming community you know, and in the simulation community too. So it's really a pleasure to, to have you today. And uh, I'm sure that the talk will be exciting. So the floor is yours, Raghu. Thank you, Fabian. Um, thank you uh, again for inviting me to speak here. Um, I have to say this is a real honor. I have a, uh, I have a soft corner for this community. I think very highly of it because of the nature of problems that invariably show up and also because of uh, the emphasis on deep theory and computation in the service of one another. This has always attracted me a lot. And so thank you again, it's a real honor to be here. So today I'm gonna to talk about confidence sets for statistical functionals of time series. So if you're, a, if you're an optimizer, you probably haven't heard of the phrase statistical functionals. I will talk about it a little bit as we go further into the talk. The underlying uh, 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 context is time series. So it is essentially data-driven. Uh, data-driven is kind of the modern phraseology for this stuff. But if you're coming from side of statistics, uh, time series is the, is the context in which we study a lot of these problems. Um, and uh, because this particular audience is very interested in stochastic optimization, this, uh, even though the method that I'm going to outline is universal in the sense that I'm going to sweep a lot of statistical functions, a lot, uh, lot of quantities like quantiles, uh, general nonlinear expectations, uh, many, many examples come under this framework. And stochastic optimization is another framework that comes under the, uh, this context, and you'll see this as we go forward. Um, I want to thank my co-authors, Peter Glynn from Stanford, Ziwei Su, who is currently at Northwestern, who was with me at Purdue, uh, and uh, my colleague Ying Che Ye from National Central University, Taiwan. Okay, I do not know how to forward this. Okay, there you go. Okay, so this is a, a quick agenda of what's coming. This is a talk about confidence sets. And so confidence intervals and confidence sets are often misunderstood. And so I want to step back a little bit so that we revisit the basics very carefully. And then we'll move on to what I call statistical functionals and state the formal problem statement. Uh, once we, uh, I'll stop there right after B for about 30 seconds or so to, to make sure that we're all on the same page. And right after B, I will outline what I call the universal method for constructing confidence intervals or confidence sets. Um, I'll stop again after C to make sure that the universal method is digested. And thereafter, we'll go into the main theorems and thereafter some further intuition and illustration. Okay, so let's start really uh, in, a, in a really basic way. Um, now, you, all of you may have heard of the, of the student's T distribution. Student's T distribution was discovered in the early 1900s by a person named William Gossett, one of my favorite researchers. Uh, and William Gossett, uh, his claim to fame was the following. So he was analyzing, I believe, uh, uh, he was working in a brewing company and he was a statistician there. And uh, he did the following. So he proved the following really, really important, important result. Uh, let us suppose that you have random variables x1, x2, x3, and so on with xn. These are, let's say, iid normal random variables with population mean that I'm calling mu and population variance I'm calling sigma square. Then, William Gossett's claim to fame was the following. What he did was, in the service of constructing a confidence interval on this population parameter that we are calling mu, he constructed what is called a standardized form of the sample mean. What do we mean by standardization? Well, you take the sample mean of this data, you subtract the population mean from it. Of course, we do not know 
the population mean. Otherwise, we wouldn't be trying to construct confidence intervals on it. But this is a hypothetical quantity. So you subtract off the mu and divide by the square root of the variance of x bar, right? So sigma hat square n is the classic estimator of sigma square, which is a squared standard deviation constructed completely from data. So this is computable. So this is called standardization in statistics. Now this object I'm going to call a, a root. A root is typically something that is used very often in statistics literature, that this object is going to come back and visit us over and over again. This is the key player, quote unquote, all through this talk. So William Gossett, what he did was he essentially demonstrated that this root right here, standardized with the sample mean, has a distribution that he called in his paper the student's t distribution. And one of the key points of the student's t distribution is that this distribution doesn't any longer depend on the population mean or the population variance. So in other words, he has kind of subtracted off the population mean and scaled away the sample variance. And what results is a distribution that depends only on the number of data points that he has used. This is a key point. Why is this important? Well, it is important because of the following. So once you know the distribution of this object R sub n, you can do the following. You can actually compute a quantity that I'm here calling T alpha n minus one. You would have learned in a basic stat class that this is called a critical value. Because Rn is distributed as student T, you can write probability of Rn greater than or equal to this quantity. I can find this quantity such that the probability of Rn exceeding this quantity is exactly equal to one minus alpha, where alpha is something that I specify. Why is this important again? Well, you can release this absolute value. You can do some algebra on the mu and you can get what is now called the confidence interval, which is you can find a lower limit and a, a, a lower bound and an upper bound, completely computable, such that the probability of mu living in this interval is exactly equal to one minus alpha. There are no asymptotics here. And this interval is what is called the one minus alpha confidence interval on the mu. So all of us know this very, very well. It is drilled into us very carefully, right? But I want, to, uh, I want you to pay attention to a couple of key objects that appear in here. The first is the estimator X bar, right? The second player in this is the estimator sigma hat M. So X bar is what I'm going to call the centering variable. It's going to come back again over and over again. It's a centering variable in this context. It's called the centering variable because it's the center of the confidence interval. Sigma hat M is essentially the object that estimates sigma. That's going to be a very key player again. And the third key player is what I'm calling the critical value, which is essentially a quantile of the limiting distribution. In this case, it's not a limiting distribution, it's an exact distribution. But we're going to see about limiting distribution. But it is the distribution's Rn's quantile, quote unquote. So three players, x bar, sigma hat n, and the quantile associated with the distribution of Rn. That's going to show up over and over again. Okay, now the question is, Gossett's confidence interval was on the population mean, right? So the natural question that one might ask is, is that an analog for more general context, like maybe stochastic optimization, where the object of interest is not the population mean, but maybe it is the optimality gap of some candidate, right? Or it could be, I'm, I have data and I'm trying to estimate the quantile. Say, let's say that you have a queuing model, a simulation of a, a queuing model, and you have waiting times that you're observing, and you want to estimate the quantile of those waiting times, waiting time distribution, or you're doing arrival process rate estimation, or you're estimating gradients in the service of optimization. There are many of these contexts where the object of interest is not new. In such situations, is there an analog like the student P or like what William Gossett did? Now, if you, are a, if you are a simulationist, quote unquote, uh, this, you're probably, you know, at least thought about this, where 
you know, let us suppose that you have all of this data. So the X1, X2, X3, and so on that you saw on the previous slide, I'm, I'm representing these as ticks on a, on, a, on a line here. What a simulationist might say is the following. Let us suppose that you're interested in something much more complicated than a population mean. Then one folklore idea is the following. You batch this data. But what, what I mean by batching the data is you split the data into some number of observations, treat this like its own data set, do what you would do. So for example, if you're trying to estimate the quantile, use this as the data set, estimate your quantile, call that estimate as Y1. In the second batch, do the same thing, call it Y2. The third batch, do the same thing, call it Y3 and so on. Now, the Y1, Y2, Y3 and so on are standing in for the X1, X2 in Gossett's case. And you generally do IID statistics on it. This is the folklore idea that is very popular in simulation. But the point of this talk is, can we actually make this more formal? Can we put this on a firm mathematical footing, just like William Gossett did? And can we actually ask, what is the uh, analog of the student T distribution in this more general context? All right, so let's take these questions a little more carefully. Because I want to sweep a lot of these contexts into one framework, I want a broad mathematical object on which to consider confidence intervals so that I can see all of these in a single purview, quote unquote. That's the first one. You can see what is coming. That mathematical object is what I'm going to call statistical functional. Second question, what are the precise characterizations of the student T and the chi-square analog? The sigma hat square N you may have seen in a basic statistics class is chi-square distribution distributed under a certain scaling. Is that a corresponding analog in this more general context? Is that a corresponding analog for students T in a more general context? William Gossett considered independent data. Almost never is your data independent. Can you actually generalize this to the context where data come from a time series or in data-driven context as, as a lot of optimizers now think about? Um, when the data are dependent, can this be generalized? What are the conditions for consistency? How to choose batches, batch size, and so on? We'll, deep, we'll deal with questions one through five, and six and seven will have to be for another time. Okay, so let's formally answer the first question. The first question is, what is the broad mathematical object that's going to stand in for the population mean? And we want to encompass a lot of these general ideas. The mathematical object is popular in statistics literature. It's called st a statistical functional theta that we're going to represent as theta. Theta is basically a functional. In functional analysis terms, a functional means a real valued map. So it has a domain, in this case, some space of probability measures, and the range lies in R, so it's real valued. Okay. So loosely, theta is anything that acts on a distribution to give you a real number. Best to think in terms of examples. So let me give you a few examples of statistical functionals. The first classic example is estimating means. So a, a mean is the type of, a population mean is a type of statistical functional. A quantile is a type of statistical functional. So if you're looking to find the quantile of GFS, then what is a quantile? You construct your CDF and you ask for the smallest y such that the infimum of that CDF is greater than or equal to one minus gamma. That is a type of statistical functional because it can be written as a functional of the underlying distribution. Gradients are a type of statistical functional. M estimation, which we'll come to later, is a type of statistical functional. CVAR, very popular uh, uh, recently, is a type of statistical function. The list actually goes on and on and on. ACF and spectral density estimation are statistical functions, robust statistics. And like trim mean and hodges lehman estimated, all of these are statistical functions. My favorite is this one, and particularly relevant to this community. So let me just spend one minute or one and a half minutes on this one. So let us suppose that we are thinking about 
finding the optimality gap in a stochastic programming problem. So uh, this is notation that I've taken from the seminal paper by Martin McEnwood from 1999. Guzan Berzan uh, and David Love, I believe, wrote a really nice paper in 2015 appearing in uh, ACM Tomax. And this one is uh, Professor Flug and his co-authors wrote a, a, a paper that was before 1999, 1998, I believe, that uh, presented some of these ideas. But the context is this. Let us suppose that you have a stochastic optimization problem. All of us know what this is. And let's say Z star is the optimal value of this problem. So let's, let's keep it simple for now. Let's say that this is, these are convex problems. And so Z star is unique. And let us say I hand you a candidate solution that I'm calling X hat, right? And my objective here, let's say, is to find the optimality gap associated with X hat, which means that I'm looking to find expectation of F of X hat minus Z star, right? And that in this case is what theta P is. So theta P is a type of uh, optimality gap of a given candidate solution is a type of statistical functional. Now you might be wondering why I have, I'm, I'm carrying this notation P. Well, it's simply because Z star can be written, of course, as a functional of P. And so that's where the P shows up here. So theta P will be the notation that we will carry through all through the star. So if you're an optimizer again, uh, a very relevant question might be, I'm looking to find the, a confidence interval on the optimality gap associated with a given candidate solution X hat. And that's what I'm going to be calling theta P. Okay, so given this, I'm going to state the for, uh, problem formally uh, so that we are going forward, we can carry this particular problem statement. I have some discrete time stationary S valued stochastic process. If these terms don't, do not mean very much to you, that's perfectly fine. Uh, there is some time series of data that we have, and it is located in some filter probability space. Again, not important, uh, at least not yet. And we are looking for a one minus confidence, one minus alpha confidence interval on theta p. So in other words, I'm looking to construct an interval i n. i n should be constructed completely from data, right? So that the probability of this unknown quantity theta p lying in this interval is exactly one minus alpha. This is the problem statement. And theta p can be a statistical functional for the purposes of this talk. So I want to stop here for about 30 seconds to make sure that we are on the same page if there are any questions uh, so that I, I do not lose you. Okay, great. Um, so given that this is the problem statement, let's revisit again what William Gossett did. Uh, if you recall, Rn is the root associated with the William Gossett problem, which is constructing the confidence interval on the population mean mu. So his root was square root of n times x bar minus mu. In the, in the first slide, I wrote this as x bar minus mu divided by sigma hat over root 10. I've just taken the root 10 up top. So William Gossett's claim to fame was he computed the distribution of Rn, right? And so that's what allowed him to compute confidence intervals on mu by, through inversion. Analogously, we are going to ask the following. We are going to construct a root as well which looks very analogous to this. So instead of X bar, we have an estimator that we are going to call theta hat sub n, constructed from batches of your data. Instead of mu, analogously, we have theta p that I talked about. Instead of sigma hat n in the William Gossett case, we have something called sigma tilde n, constructed from the batches again. And we're going to scale it exactly as before. And pretty much all of the rest of the talk is going to think about how to characterize the distribution of R sub n, just like William Gossett did in the mean case. And just as X bar was called the centering variable, we are going to call theta hat n as the implied estimator. 
right? And sigma hat n, we're going to call it the variance constant, just as usual. These, these, these are just terms, so I'm going to use this uh, terminal, the center, centering variable, I'm going to call it the implied estimator uh, for reasons that will become clear shortly. Okay, so we're going to focus on R sub n. Uh, all, of, all of our analysis is going to focus on R sub n. Now, whenever we talk about confidence intervals, the two elephants in the room are bootstrapping uh, uh, and what is called subsampling. Subsampling is, is one of the most popular methods, uh, very general method uh, in statistics for constructing confidence sets, not just for statistical functionals, but for far more uh, uh, general objects. Bootstrap and subsampling, we are not going to talk details about it, but I just want to make a really quick point. The quick point is the following. Bootstrap, subsampling, and the, and the method that I'm going to outline here are in essence doing the same thing, but in different ways. Subsampling, or I'm sorry, bootstrap is taking this root that we are calling R sub n, and it's estimating the distribution of R sub n using a method called resampling. This was a great invention of Brad Efron in the late 70s. So the bootstrap essentially computes this distribution using a method called resampling. Subsampling in the 90s by Dimitris and, uh, Dimitri Politis and Joseph Romano uh, estimates again the distribution of Rn using a method called subsampling. I won't go into these two. In this talk, we are going to identify the weak limit. By weak limit, what I mean is we're going to think about the distribution and we're going to see as the amount of data increases, where does the distribution of this guy go? And that we're going to call the weak limit. We're going to specifically identify the weak limit of Rn so that asymptotically we obtain exact confidence intervals on theta p so that we'll cover all of these cases. Okay, so that is the relationship between bootstrap, subsampling, and the method we propose. Okay, so now uh, I talked about the centering variable and you probably already see that the centering variable and this variance parameter are two of the three key players. The three key players are the centering variable, variance parameter, and the third one is the quantile of the limiting distribution that I talked about. Now, different confidence intervals will result from different choices of theta hat n and sigma tilde n. And we propose what are called OB type one. OB stands for overlapping batches. OB type one, OB type two, and OB type three interval estimators by changing for different choices of theta hat n and sigma tilde n, we get three different types of these estimators. And I'm going to just focus on the first two of these because these two are really, really intuitive. I will be able to uh, get you to internalize it. Okay, so this picture should guide us a lot in constructing the first interval estimator. So again, recall what this, uh, what this line denotes. These are just data. These data need not be real value, by the way. They can, they can live in any space, right? So they can be RD valued. They can be basically curves. It doesn't matter. You're taking this data and you're batching them. By batching them, what I mean is I'm taking the data observation one through data observation M sub N. This notation M sub N is coming from the fact that N is the total data size. And the first batch is of size M sub N and goes from the first observation to the mnth observation, okay? And the second batch is offset by an amount d sub n. So the second batch starts at d sub n plus one, goes to d sub n plus m sub n. And the third batch, again, is offset by an amount d sub n. So third batch starts at 2dn plus one and ends at 2dn plus m sub n, right? So you, can, you see the point here. We're just dividing the, the whole data set into batches of size M sub n, no big deal. One little point here is that these batches can be overlapping for reasons that will become very clear later. We are trying to squeeze as much information as possible from this, okay? And they can be partially overlapping. 
for again reasons that will become clear. So now having formed these batches, the first step is I construct what I'm calling the batch estimators. I'm calling the batch estimator constructed from the jth batch. I'm giving it the notation theta hat sub j. Okay, and this I'm going to carry through because each batch is of size m sub n. Okay, so theta hat sub j is the jth batch estimator. I have b sub n batches, and I also have the centering variable theta hat n. One way to think about the centering variable here, theta hat n, is imagine using the entire data set and doing what you do for the individual batches. So take a particular context. Let's say you're thinking about optimization, right? So the classic paper in 1999 by Mac, Morton, and Wood divide, divided this into batches that were non-overlapping. And on each batch, they constructed an estimated optimality gap. So those are standing in for the theta hat j's. And the centering variable in that uh, multiple replications procedure was the average of these guys. And so theta hat n in that case was simply the average of these batch estimates. And you can, cut, you can construct many, many different types of these centering variables. In fact, uh, uh, in the 2015 paper by Guzan, uh, Guzan Bayraksan and Dave Love, they, they actually did something slightly different for the centering variable. Um, in fact, Subrajit Sen may have talked about something yesterday on, um, on, on these compromised solutions that could potentially form a certain type of a centering variable. But for this OB type one estimator, I'm considering a very particular centering variable, theta hat n, which is you take the entire data set, do what you're, what you're doing, meaning that if you're computing a quantile, you compute it with the entire data set. That's what I'm calling theta hat n. In the individual batches, I'm calling theta hat j. Then you do what is most reasonable, which is you compute the sigma hat square analog, which is you have the individual batch estimates, you compute the squared standard deviation, take the square root, exactly what you do. There are b sub n batches. There is a correction that you need to do that I'm not going to talk about so that it's asymptotically unbiased. There's also a scaling that you need to do because the individual batches are of size m sub n. So you have to blow it up, quote unquote. Once you do that, you do exactly what William Gossett did in the mean case, which is he computed a theta hat n minus theta p root n divided by the analog of the standard deviation that is computed from here. So no different at all. It is, it is simply we're just analogizing what William Gossett did. Once you do this, constructing the confidence interval is exactly what William Gossett did again. You take the centering variable plus or minus some quantity, the third player emerges here. I've not told you how I'm going to compute this. This is going to stand in for the critical value times sigma hat divided by rho 10. This is the confidence interval that we construct. I have not told you what this is going to be, in the multiple replications procedure of 1999, for example, they use a student T statistic. Now I'm going to argue that the asymptotic distribution of R sub n, which is this here, this is R sub n. The asymptotic distribution of R sub n is not student T, it's not normal, it deviates from it. So if you use a student T, it's going to result in something that is, uh, is going to result in incorrect confidence intervals. So we're going to actually derive the limiting distribution, the exact limiting distribution of this guy. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a little bit. So this is the OB type one estimator. Similarly, you can do something slightly different, which is called OB type two estimator. Everything is exactly the same. Instead, I'm going to change my theta hat n, the centering variable. Instead of actually taking a grand estimator that uses the entire data set, I can average these batches. And that is the theta hat, theta bar sub n. This is the MRP, or multiple replications procedure in optimization from 1999. So this coincides with that. And using that, you can construct a confidence interval that you have here. That we are calling the OB type two estimator. Okay, so all of this should be very, very intuitive to you. 
so this brings us brings us to the to the key question what is the main question here the main question is what is the limiting behavior of t1 obn which is r sub n for the ob1 estimator this is the r sub n for the ob2 estimator so this is the root for the ob1 estimator root for the ob2 estimator so our job in the my job in the rest of the talk is understanding the limiting behavior of these two guys let me stop here again for 30 seconds to make sure that this method is internalized if there is a question Okay, so now I'm going to provide an answer to this question in a nutshell um, before we actually present the main theorems of this talk. Depending on the batch size m sub n, we get very two we, we get two very different regimes of convergence. So depending upon batch size, what do we mean by batch size here? This is m sub n, and the total data set size is n. So depending upon how m sub n behaves with respect to n, if m sub n over n goes to zero and m sub n goes to infinity, this in fact is the regime um, for stochastic optimization, for example, in the 2015 paper by Guzen and David Love, they consider this particular regime, in fact, it's what is called the Z limit. So in this regime, it turns out that both of these estimators go to the norm. And this, it turns out, is not, not particularly a surprise. So when the batch sizes are small in comparison with the total data set size, each of these estimators goes to the norm. The surprise comes when m sub n divided by n goes to some beta, which is non-zero. That is, the beta lives in the open interval zero to one. When m sub n over n goes to beta as n tends to infinity, we get a normal, non-normal OB type limit. Okay, and th this is called the large batch regime. And I'm going to show later uh, in using numerical illustrations and also certain curves that this particular large batch limit is very important because it turns out that using small batches is the convergence to the, the distribution is especially slow. Getting correct convergence or fast convergence to the coverage probabilities associated with the confidence interval is very, very important that you use big batches. And we'll come back to that issue in just a little bit. So my emphasis will be very much on this large batch limit. Some assumptions, we need a couple of assumptions. Um, we will assume, for example, that this theta hat n minus theta p times square root of n follows a central limit theorem. Central limit theorem of the form root n times theta hat n minus theta p goes to sigma times a z random variable. Sigma, of course, we are not assuming it's norm. It's just that it follows a CLT. And there are, uh, if time permits, I'll, I'll, you know, I will show you that all of the initial uh, applications that I outlined, they all have a CLT that is well established. Of course, we need to assume that this object sigma exists. So variance constant existence is important. We don't quite need stationarity. I'm not going to talk in detail about it. We need something called strong mixing in the sense that we're going to allow dependence, but the dependence should not be too much. And that is codified using an idea called strong mixing. We also need something called a strong invariant principle, which I will not go into detail here. Okay, the first key result associated with this is the Z limit, like I noted before. This, if you recall, is the root associated with the OB type one estimator, right? So notice the similarity again with William Gossett's standardized variable, theta hat n, subtracting off from the quantity you want, scaling it by root n and dividing it by sigma hat. It turns out that as long as mn over n goes to zero, but mn goes to infinity, this object converges to a norm. The proof is very long for this, but it is very intuitive. So it's not, um, it, is, uh, it, it gives you the standard result. And one of the key things in this 
in this sort of a result is that we have assumed that the numerator follows a CLT. And, and it turns out that if MN divided by N, that is the batch size is a small in comparison to the total data set size, sigma hat consistently estimates sigma square. I mean, sigma hat square consistently estimates sigma square. And then you can use something called Sl Slutsky's theorem to demonstrate that this goes to a normal. So none of this is really surprising. Okay, so you're just estimating the bottom quantity really, really well by using many, many small batches. And if that happens, you get a normal limit. The surprise really comes when you use big batches. And like I noted before, big batches are crucial in order to get good, well-behaved confidence intervals. It turns out that when batch sizes are big, that is when Mn divided by N goes to beta lying in the open interval, it turns out that the analog of the sample variance does not converge consistently to sigma square, but instead it, comes, it converges to a distribution that we have characterized. That is the analog of the chi-square, something that I advertised very early in the talk. So this is the analog of the chi-square distribution in the batching case, in the overlapping batch case. It turns out that this chi-square is a certain functional of the Brownian motion. Okay, so you have a stochastic process that we call the Brownian motion. And by integrating this, by, by actually taking these batches and taking them in the continuous time limit, you can demonstrate that this object, as mn divided by n goes to beta as n tends to infinity, converges to a, a somewhat complicated object involving Brownian motion. But if you actually stare closely at it, it is perfectly analogous to based upon the quantities that you construct. Here again, I won't go into uh, further detail. Uh, I want to make a quick point here. Even though this object has sort of a complicated structure that is an integral of the Brownian motion, computing it is fairly easy. You can use Monte Carlo, you can actually use Laplace transforms and you just have to compute it once, quote unquote. Because all that we are looking to do is we are looking to correspondingly compute the quantiles of the T analog. So just after you get this object, you do what William Gossett did, which is you have the analog of the normal, which is the value of the standard Brownian motion of the numerator divided by square root of chi-square analog in the denominator. And that is the limit. That is the limit. This is the analog, quote unquote, of the student T in the overlapping batch case. And all that we need are the quantiles of this distribution. And this can be computed very efficiently. And we actually do that. We have code uh, that actually computes the quantiles of this guy. Again, uh, remind yourself, uh, to, just to remind you, uh, why are the critical values important? Because th that, this was the third player that is crucial in constructing the confidence interval, apart from the uh, centering variable and the uh, variance constant estimator. So we can compute this, we can compute tables, or we have code that compute the quantiles of the associated OB type one distribution. We have a similar thing for the OB type two for large batch, right? So remember OB type two is the one that in the stochastic optimization setting, OB type two is the multiple replications procedure where the centering variable is simply the average. And it turns out that there is a similar limit that can be characterized. That is a certain integral of the squared Brownian motion differences. And you can correspondingly compute the student P analog whose, uh, whose quantiles we can compute quite efficiently using code. And all of this helps us put things together. Now we can, just as we have computed the, uh, uh, just as we have computed all of these objects, for example, the, the distribution, the asymptotic distribution, we can also compute, for example, the moments. What I mean by the moments are we can actually compute the expectation of sigma hat square. Sigma hat square basically is Rn, right? So we can compute, uh, it's related to Rn, not quite Rn, but we can relate it to Rn. So you can compute the moments, you can compute the expectation, the variance of this guy. And beta here is the ratio of mn over n. So it's very closely related to 
you can see how this is very closely related to how big the batch sizes are because of beta is showing up. Okay, so now uh, a very legitimate question that one might ask is, um, are we, am I making much ado about nothing? So in other words, uh, I claimed right in the beginning that using the normal distribution or the student's t distribution as one is usually tempted to do, uh, using those critical values to compute your, your final confidence interval, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. Why not we just do that instead of going through these OB type one and OB type two and OB type three distributions? So in other words, am I, am I making much ado about nothing? Can we just use the student's t, right? So how can one possibly test this? Well, one way to test this is do exactly the same as what we have done, but instead, instead of using the OB type one distribution to compute your critical values, why not just use the student t and the normal, which is exactly what we do here. The first interval right here, notice uh, this is the centering variable, theta hat n. This is sigma hat n divided by root n. So use either, either the first method or the second method to compute this guy. First or the second method to compute this guy. And then instead of using the OB critical value, just use the normal table, let's say. So that's the first method. That comes from classical statistics. Now, this is the interval that we are proposing. Everything else is the same except I've replaced phi inverse with the distribution that I'm computing, quote unquote. This is what typically is used in the simulation literature and for example, in MRP, for example. Everything else is the same, just changing the critical value, that's it. Subsampling again is the analog in the stochastic optimization case for MRP with a slight difference. I, I won't talk about that in detail. Now, we can get rid of all of these guys because the only thing that changes are these quotients. So why not just plot these quotients and see how they change, how they differ from one another? And that's what you see in this graph. What I did here is I took a very classic uh, AR1 process. An AR1 process is a stochastic process that has this form. It's a time series that looks like this. That is the subsequent observation is the previous observation times a quantity called phi, and then you add a constant to it, and then you add some noise. And let's say what we want to do is we want to use least squares to estimate phi, right? So suppose you did that, and you're trying to construct a confidence interval on the estimator or on this object phi, let's say. Okay, now we did this using all of these methods that I just outlined right here and I'm just plotting these quotients so that we can, we can take all of the redundant elements out. We can just observe what is happening. The key line to follow here is the red line here. This is the hypothetical perfect case where you actually know the exact distribution of this root. So we are pretending like we know the exact distribution of the root. So that is this red line. And I'm plotting it as a function of the data set size. And this black line here is I'm using student's t. So notice here, even after 10,000 observations, the student t stays away from the red line. So it's giving you the incorrect coverage interval, quote unquote. But how much does it miss it? Well, in this example, for example, you can actually see plotted as a function of little n, n is 100, 500,000, all the way to 10,000, I'm using students T and I'm plotting on I'm writing the confidence intervals. We are, we are actually attempting to get uh, 0.95 confidence intervals. So the coverage here is 0 0.73 if I used a student T and I used big batches with beta is equal to 0 0.25. What is appearing in the brackets here is the half width. That is how wide the confidence intervals are. Notice here that even when I use 10,000 observations, this is off by about five to 6%. Here we, we kind of hit it. It's uh, very close to 0 0.003. So this is the OB type one. It matches it precisely. Now, the reason why I say again, that using big batches are very important is illustrated through the second column. 
right? So in the second column, if you use small batches, mn is equal to square root of n, notice how even after 10,000 observations, your confidence intervals are off by about 15%. Really important. The, the story is pretty much the same. This is an example from CVAR. The story is, uh, th this is in this particular case, the example is, this example is an easy example. So subsampling wins here. Small, using small batches wins. But you can see using students T is about 10% off. Uh, using the OB type one is, uh, is uh, hits it. Uh, in fact, by about 100 to 500 observations, we are right there. I have about five minutes before I should stop. So now there is one other type of OB estimator, which where the uh, estimating the, the variance constant is, you, is done using something called standardized time series. And computing the standardized time series is, is not as intuitive, so I won't go into detail, but uh, it, is, it is a very, very popular idea in statistics and particularly the simulation literature. And we have similar corresponding results for uh, standardized time series as well. So let me summarize all of these slew of results using this unified table. I'm just making a couple of key points really here. The point, the, the first key point is the following. Where you, could, you could potentially use batches and mimic what you do in the population mean case using the ideas that I just uh, outlined. If you use small batches, that is mn over n goes to zero and mn goes to infinity, it turns out that you estimate, the estimator that you use consistently estimates the unknown variance parameter. And the distribution, the asymptotic distribution of Rn, the root, is z. That's why we call this the z statistic. In a situation where you use big batches, you don't get consistent estimation, but you get estimation to some distribution that we can characterize that we call the OB type one distribution and correspondingly a student T analog fully characterized using which you can compute the confidence interval. The interesting point here is, the underlying point here is you don't have to estimate sigma square consistently. You can get away with actually computing this not consistently, just, just using convergence and distribution and still get the correct confidence intervals, much like uh, William Gossett did. You have a similar story in OB type two and OB type three, and that kind of forms the crux of everything that we're doing. I'll conclude here with a couple of uh, uh, comments that I feel are, are useful and important. The first, overlapping batches are powerful for confidence sets and statistical functionals. And I gave you several examples of statistical functionals constructed from time series. So the variance parameter, like I just noted in the previous slide, need not be esti estimated consistently. Instead, you can use large batches and you can cancel out, quote unquote, the sigma that appears in the numerator and the denominator of this estimate of the root. Number three, big batches results in non-normal distribution limits, non-normal, non-student t. And so characterizing these turns out to be especially important. Otherwise, you will be missing your confidence intervals sometimes by as much as 20% or 25%, depending on the problem. There are many unresolved questions specific to stochastic programming and stochastic optimization. So in the context of stochastic optimization, for example, you might say there's a trade-off between high computation and high accuracy. Well, if you go back to this picture, in a situation where your centering variable uses the entire data set and you're using, and you're in the world of multiple replications procedure or overla with overlapping batches or some such thing, this can be computationally very inefficient because you're using the whole batch size. And so your instinct might be to use small batches because the complexity is small. And that's the correct instinct, I think. And so, but then you're gonna suffer from loss in accuracy and this quantification of loss and accuracy versus computation, I find is very, very important. 
And second, the choice of centering. And like I noted before, there are various centering variables you could use, like the compromise uh, variable that uh, Suprajit Sen was talking about yesterday. And uh, Guzan did something uh, slightly different in her paper. Uh, depending upon the choice of centering, you will get different confidence intervals and correspondingly different associated with different limits. And none of those are characterized by OB1 through OB3. And so that I feel is an important question. I said, is the CLT assumption too much? I've run out of time, so I'll, I'll, I, I will not go into that detail. If a question comes up, I'll talk about it. And it turns out also that there is a very natural extension of all of these ideas to the infinite dimensional context where you don't assume that, the that you're in the world of statistical functionals, but instead of constructing a quantile, you're constructing a quantile field, right? Or in stochastic optimization, let's say you're not just computing the, the optimality gap at a particular location, but you're constructing optimality gaps at many, many different locations. And you want that all of that simultaneously. All of these you know, uh, are, do not fall, but then these ideas, there's a very natural extension to those. I'll stop there. There are some really interesting historical notes uh, relating to the methods that are outlined. Again, if a question comes up, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you again, and it's been a real honor to talk here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raghu. It's a very impressive talk. So uh, are there any questions in the audience? Uh, I see some raised and Tito has a question, so I will ask Tito to ask his question. Hi, Tito. Hello, Raghu. How are you? Uh, yeah, thank you for a really interesting talk. This is a, a very nice work. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions here about this. Um, first is, OK, how important is the normality acceptor? Right? Because if you look at the, the, the Gauss's uh, result, if have, Everything starts from the, the assumption that each data point is normal, right? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. So in your case, I understand you don't require that. You only require a CLT, correct? Right, correct. Right. So the first question is whether you think this, um, this, this differences that you saw in the numerical experiments could be attributed to that because maybe your actual data was not normal. So, and, but the, the two students assume normality. So the, 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 that's why they cover, you didn't get the right coverage. Could that be the reason? Yeah, this is an uh, insightful question. So let, let me actually go back and I was expecting this question. So let's, let me answer this in two parts. Uh, how, so actually to go back to uh, what Tito is really asking. So if you go back to the assumptions, one of the key assumptions in order for all of these results to go through is this one what I'm calling A1. So there is some implied estimator that I'm calling theta hat n. There is a true quantity that I'm trying to compute, theta p. And when you scale it by root n, as n times to infinity, I'm assuming that it converges in distribution to sigma times z0, 1. And Tito's question, if I understand correctly, is how important is this? How is it, uh, uh, is it satisfied widely? So let me answer that part first. So um, let's go to many of the examples that, we, that I started off the talk with. So mean estimation, quantiles, gradients, M estimation, CWA, ACF and spectral density estimation, robust statistics. These are the objects with which I started. In every one of these cases, that CLT is satisfied, it turns out. You can actually get, uh-huh, go ahead, Tito. Sorry, the, the original question, I was, I was thinking of the normality of each data point, right? Which is the, to construct, to apply T, to, to get the T distribution, right? Uh, you, you, you need to assume that each individual data point is normal, right? So Exactly. So we don't need, and, we don't, yeah. Right. So here you don't, yeah, you only need the CLT because then you apply to each, uh, Precisely. which leads then to the second part of the question, which is, um, for in the stochastic optimization case, then there is, a, I think, a, a little difficulty there, right? Because if you look, for example, at the optimal value of the of a stochastic optimization problem, 
uh, you may not get normality, right? Asymptotic normality. Uh, you do in case you have unique solutions, but if you have multiple solutions, you, there is, right? There's the classical okay. result, you get like a, the, it converges to a minimum of normal distributions, right? So then you don't, you get, don't get the CLT type result. So how, how do we go about this? In, uh, Again, a really insightful question. Um, so in a situation, so let me answer the second part because it's of particular interest to me. It turns out that when you have multiple solutions, um, you can, it turns out you can show, like you pointed out, that it converges to, instead of converging to, uh, instead of you having a CLT, you have something like a Gaussian process convergence result. So a mixture of normals, quote unquote, each of which is centered around the various uh, local minima, quote unquote, or not local minima, the various global minima, quote unquote. So it is, so you have, you, you uh, in, in current work that we are doing, we are relaxing this assumption in two different ways. The first way is we are going from being in a single dimension. Notice here that this is a single dimensional result. So we go from a CLT to a, a Gaussian process result. So in other words, these are objects that are living in infinite dimensional space and you have a mixture of Gaussian, Gaussian distributions, quote unquote. And now, so you have an extra parameter apart from sigma, which is the mixing parameter, right? So in addition to the centering variable and the variance parameter, you will have to estimate the mixing parameter as well. And once you do that using batches, at least in principle, you get a similar result but we don't have all of the details buttoned up yet. So in short, what happens is instead of a CLT type assumption, you have a Gaussian process convergence assumption, which is very, very general. But then the price you pay is you have an extra parameter to estimate. Instead of the three key players, you'll have four key players that will come into play that we need to, that we need to take care of. It's a difficult problem. I see. Okay. Thank you, Raghu. I don't want to take up all your time, but thank you very much. I know your has a question too. So. Hans. Thank you, Tito. Uh, Johannes has a question to ask too, so I will ask Johannes to ask his question. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Raghu. Very interesting. Uh, I just wonder if um, uh, this thing about the batch size can uh, help um, you know, talking about what are better choices or batch sizes, and you seem to be steering us in one direction. Can this help, you know, uh, explain, for instance, why in machine learning people like to do batch sizes of 256 instead of batch size of one? Or I really say stochastic gradient descent, you know, you are more in a, you know, in kind of in a algorithmic setting and not in an M estimator setting. Uh, but is it possible to say something? Uh, say about stochastic gradient descent and batch size from what you have here? It's interesting, but the many batches that people use in machine learning, that batch size is slightly different from the context in which we are doing this because this batch size is in estimating the covariance parameter that the stochastic gradient descent algorithm goes to when it converges. So this is the batch size associated with estimating that quantity. That is the mini batch there. It is the batch size that is used in estimating the gradient in the service of going in a descent direction. So these two are, are slightly different, but I think, I think there is a connection in the sense that there was a, a paper in, uh, in 2018 by Lan and Zhang it's, uh, they introduced uh, uh, 2018 or 2019, but they introduced an algorithm called SASA, S-A-S-A, -S -A, where they actually use batches to actually uh, progressively estimate the sigma parameter within, uh, within stochastic gradient descent. And interestingly, they use a student P distribution and we are trying to say, no, 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 don't use a student P distribution. And uh, you can actually end up using really big batches and use the correct distribution 
and you might get better results is what we are attempting to do now, but still in the works. Okay, so thank you, Raghu. Uh, it's already two, two o'clock. Uh, maybe a very quick question. Uh, so your results uh, assume stationarity, uh, but in time series, in finance, for instance, stationarity assumption is, is a big assumption. Is the, and often of our times, uh, the regime is changing. So. Since I understand that it's a limit result, that you obtain really limit results, but is there any way to to try to to adjust the results just to to part of time when the he kind of holds and to update the, the constant surface when the regime is switching? I'm sorry, Fabian, but I had uh, difficulty understanding the key part of your question. Okay, uh, so it's, it's not that important, but uh, anyway, I, I was just asking about the stationarity assumption. Stationarity, I see, stationarity, got it. So, so okay. Stationarity assumption is very important, it's results in the synthetic results, but uh, um, many time series data uh, do yeah. not satisfy this assumption. We can assume that stationarity holds in some time limit, yeah. but uh, we, have, we observe some switching in the regimes, for instance, it is typical in finance. So is there any way to, to, to take the result to address them, to, to, to take the fact that uh, the society can only hold at, uh, during a certain amount of time? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Uh, it turns out that the stationary, I, I, I clubbed all of these assumptions under a singular umbrella, but it turns out that the stationarity assumption is needed only for the first regime. It's only needed for the uh, small batch regime, it turns out. For the big batch regime, what we only, we, we are hiding, quote unquote, we don't care that the underlying process is stationary, we only care that we have a CLT of this sort. Now you might ask, uh, yeah, yeah, but that is, that is true, but really, uh, you know, all of these examples, for example, when I give references that, when I give you references that all, in all of these cases, the CLT holds, well, a lot of these results assume that the underlying process is really stationary, and that's how they come up with the CLT. Yeah. So I, uh, I don't quite, I don't have a definitive answer. Uh, if somebody says it is non-stationary, unless you give me something more, I won't be able to say something. Meaning that to actually deal with this in the most general form is gonna be really, really difficult. So for example, if you tell me uh, that you're reaching stationarity at a particular speed, say exponentially reach stationarity or polynomially reach stationarity, some such, uh, some such uh, uh, crutch that will help us uh, formulate these results. Without these, I don't know how one might be able to do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we are running out of time, so I will suggest that uh, people that are interested continue the dis uh, discussion in one of the breakout rooms.